Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 25th celebration of our daily gratitude to Helen group. We say one to Helen a day in gratitude for all the blessings Hashem showers upon us. And today we are privileged to have the speaker, Deborah Hanna Weisswasser from Chile, Toronto, Canada. And I want to tell you just a little bit about her because we are so privileged to have her be our speaker today. Uh, Devorah Hanna has been doing public speaking for over 20 years. She has spoken for the National Council of Jewish Women, Amuna Women, Congregation Shomri Shabbos, Forest Hills Jewish Center, Clanton Park Synagogue, Congregation Shari Tefila, Kehillat Shari Torah, JCLL, Agudas Israel of Toronto, NCSY, two camps, two, two summer camps, a Shatora Jewish Renaissance Center, and numerous private, private residences. She's taught high school and seminary on Jewish topics and presently teaches women for Orthodox conversion. Um, on the side, she's led a women's choir, done labor coaching, wrote Jewish songs, and is presently writing a children's book. She tries to make every one of her lectures a life changer. So that's amazing. She has um, a date of a, a broadcast every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, and it's called Torah with a Takeaway. You can sign up for the live stream by emailing debmenzel at gmail.com, D-E-B-M-E-N-Z-E-L at gmail.com. And um, Devorah Hanna, if you want to mention just a little bit more about that and I am privileged to introduce you now and let you start our um, our share, our celebration share. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Lori, for, oh no, I hope I don't have all these phones ringing all around me. Um, I, uh, yeah, everyone thinks that I'm free. I don't know why, but they do. Um, I don't know. I can't see myself. I, I like to see myself. Is it possible to focus so I can see myself? I am see, going. I want to see if the camera's on me just for a moment. There we go. How about that? I just want to make sure if I if I if I'm my head's on straight and things like that. You're on straight. <laughs> You're perfect. Do you see yourself now? No, but I see this lovely Tversky lady. <laughs> I don't know why you see me, but you look You're, lovely. You're now pinned to the, the screen. You, you okay. Have, if you go up to view in the right hand corner. Uh, Oh, okay. 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 And then change it to speaker. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. I did it, but nothing happens. Do I have to do it the other way? One second. It's not working. Uh, okay. Hmm. I will um, try doing it. Maybe over you're here. in charge of it. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, fine. Thank you. That's all. I don't have to look at myself again. I just, my Rav said that I could speak for an audience with men as long as you only see my head. So that's why I'm trying to keep his, uh, keep his teachings. Okay. Good afternoon, at least Toronto time, ladies. And Eric Sistrella gets here maybe near the middle of the night. No, not yet. You're about nine o'clock at night. And everywhere else, Pacific time, Alaskan time, wherever you are in the world, greetings from the Arctic here. We've had a lot of uh, snow recently and very cold temperatures, but it is, things are kind of settling down. Anyways, we are mazel tov to all of you on your 25th celebration of, of completing a Tehillim every single day. It's a beautiful, beautiful path to try to take. And I thought I would speak a lot about the origins of David HaMelech and the attitude of gratitude that stems from it. You know, we're told that the reason why we say Tehillim, well, Tehillim is the basis for all our davening, is because David Amelech experienced every type of negativity and positivity that a human being could experience in a lifetime in order that Hashem should squeeze out of him every drop of, uh, of connecting with his creator throughout any type of times. So Tehillim is the perfect vehicle. There's always somewhere, somehow, that we could connect to our, you know, to our creator through that. Now, I just have to say, as an aside, I don't know exactly the whole audience here. I once spoke for an audience of women, and most of them were not religious at all. And they were fighting me that how King David was forgiven by God because he had all this lust in his heart 
And yet still, it shows even a sinner can create Tehillim. Now, we do believe a person can do tshuva any time in his life. But people, I recommend to you to take a class of any style. I'll dare you to take a class, learn any of the commentaries on the sins of King David and how vi we should have such sins that King David had. His sins were so minuscule. It's just the, the verses, the Torah is very uh, minute in, in, in addressing people. And every little thing he did was considered like a major sin. He did not engage in any major sin with Bathsheba, et cetera. And the reason why King David is our sweet singer of Israel is because he has such a persona of being a person whose every fiber of his being connected with his creator. Now let's not leave out his ancestry. He descended, if we have to go way back, <clears throat> he come, came from the tribe of Yehuda, from Judah. And Yehuda comes from Leah, Leah Imenu, our matriarch. Leah was also very well known for her prayer. Leah was destined to marry, um, she was married to Yaakov, she was destined to marry Esau, and only through her power of prayer, it said she cried so hard that her eyelashes became, you know, she lost some eyelashes and just crying for years and praying to God. And she was answered and she became, she wasn't originally supposed to be the wife of, uh, of Yaakov, but through her prayers, through her davening, she became more, uh, worthy of being his wife. And not only that, but the descendants of Leah are very illustrious. All the monarchy, Yehuda is the monarchy of the Jewish people. We have the tribe of Levi. We have Yisachar, the Sanhedrin, all these great people all came from Leah and from her prayers. And Leah was the one that merited to be buried with Yaakov. And it says in many places that in this world, Rachel was his wife, but in the world to come, his wife is really Leah. So a person that can accomplish an awful lot through prayer. But let's analyze where the whole business of Yehuda started, because it tells us a lot about what we're supposed to think when we say to Hillam and our whole attitude, our whole goal in saying, you, in saying to Hillam. <clears throat> when Leah gave birth to her fourth child, now so far where there were, there were 12 tribes of Israel and four is already getting, I mean, four matriarchs rather, if you wanna call it that. And each one was supposed to have, you know, uh, three children. And that would have been fair if she, oh, she got more than her share. This time when she gives birth to Yehuda, she proclaims hapam, Ode es Hashem. This time I'm going to thank Hashem. Al Cain, therefore, Kara Eshmo Yehuda. Therefore, she decided to name that child Yehuda. So let's decide what does it mean this time I'm going to thank God? Would she never thank God in her whole life? And the second question is she called him Yehuda, like, you know, I'll, I'll be grateful. Like, what, what is the point of, uh, you know, what is the point of those two ideas? Let's get into them. So, first of all, the idea of mode to thank God. We're told by Rav Shimon Bar Yochai in the Gemara of Brachot, Amr Rav Yochanan, B'Shem Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, Miyom Shabara Kadesh Baruch Hu Lamo, from the time that God created the world, Lo Haya Adam Shehodel Kadesh Baruch Hu Ad Shaba Saleya, Vahodato, Shvenemar Hapam Odes Hashem. Says Rav Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when God created the world, Nobody uh, 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 thanked God the way in the manner that Leah did until she came and thanked him at this point for her fourth child. This time I'll thank Hashem. Now she thanked Hashem for her other three previous children. God saw my affliction when she had Ruvain and, you know, it, you know, God is, my husband will now accompany me. She did thank God. And not only that, she wasn't the first person in the world that ever thanked God. Eliezer, when he found the Shidduch, for his master Avram, and he found for Yitzhak a shidduch with Rivka, he thanked Hashem, shame the, the, the Semites, uh, the son of Noah, they thanked Hashem. What does it mean that nobody ever thanked Hashem before Leah came around? So to understand that, there's many different explanations. I'm gonna give you three actually, just to show you how the Torah has a lot of depth. Rav Shimon Schwab, the Quran of Levracha, tells us that when Leah had her fourth child, see Leah had a bit of a stigma. You know, she was passed off by her father in a cheating way, in a whole ceremony. She was, you know, she was being portrayed as Rachel and Rachel gave her the clues to the, like the little personal cues to, to give to Yaakov. So he would think he married the right girl. That shows how much Yaakov paid attention 
to what his wife looked like. He didn't even realize he married the wrong one. Um, and, but, you know, but throughout the years, even though Yaakov was the epitome of a good husband, he harbored a thought in his heart that maybe she was partners in crime with her father, the trickster, Lavan. Lavan, you know, she was supposed to really marry the younger sister. That's who he worked for seven years. And all of a sudden here he is being passed off, you know, by somebody else. You know, he's, he's given the wrong wife. So Shervin Schwab tells us that when she thanked God this time around, when she said, this time I'm going to thank Hashem, she thanked Hashem saying, this time, you know, my lot is still not perfect. I don't know if I'm ever going to be my husband's favorite wife. Now, Yaakov didn't show any signs externally, but internally she felt that there was something that he just didn't trust her to the degree he trusted Rachel. Some kind of feeling, slight feeling she had. And she's here thanking God. I am thanking you now that this world, albeit it's not perfect, I feel totally at peace. I am totally grateful. That's a big accomplishment. And that's what made her be the woman who for the first time ever, thank God. What does it mean she never, she thanked God for a world, although not perfect, is perfect for her. Another point Rav Shimon Schwab mentions is sometimes if a king pays you attention, even though he just gives you a small token, he gives you a, a pen, you know, with the monarchy uh, stamped on it or something, picture of the monarchy. To you, it's a big deal. You got a present from the king. This time she felt that present from the king. And although, again, it's imperfect, she knew it was straight from Hashem, straight from God. Another famous interpretation, just to give you a little bit of a gamut here, is that Rav Hanoch Hanach Lebowitz mentions it. Um, somebody else, I forgot who else mentions this. Um, Okay, anyways, I think it's the Shari Ora mentions it too, that, that she thanked God that this time she got more than she deserves. She's the first person that felt she got more than she deserves. So we see there's a little bit of a difference, but in general, these are different motives for us to be grateful and thankful. Sometimes to thank things, thank Hashem for things that are not perfect. Sometimes even if it's a small token of something a little bit good, the king has paid us attention. And also when we get more than what we deserve, and that's what she felt. She had her fourth child. Nobody else deserved more than three. She got four. She ended up having six. And she realized that she, ha she owes Hashem a lot. Now, Oda, to, to, to be grateful, Yehuda it comes from the root, the root word, lahodos, lahodot, to be grateful, or it means to admit. Two explanations of the word mode. And we are called Yehudim, even though we come from Yisrael, we come from the whole Klal Yisrael, we are identifiable as tribe of Judah. Now, why? We're not, we're not Judeans, all of us. You know, only monarchy is our Judeans, or people worthy of monarchy. The reasons why we are grateful, you know, as Jews, our trademark, our hallmark is supposed to be gratitude. We're supposed to be grateful people. And that's what's supposed to make us unique, not just being the children of Israel, but something that every Jew is supposed to aspire to is to be grateful, to feel we have more than we deserve, to feel that this world, even though it's not perfect, we have so much to appreciate. And that's why we as a nation are called Yehudim. Also, the first word we say when we get up in the morning is moda. I thank you, Hashem. This, these are all signs that we are seeing this world as being wonderful, gratitude. That should be our attitude. But lahodot also means to admit like to admit when you're wrong. Yehuda, in fact, admitted, we're not going to go there, but it's a whole long discussion with Tamar. I'm not going there. That'll take us an hour. <laughs> but um, the idea is that Yehuda is, it demonstrates that you can admit when you're wrong. And David Amelech admitted when he was wrong. That's what made him, even though he did sin, albeit very sl sl slightly, his sin he regretted so badly that he was, that's considered as if he did a mitzvah. Because when you, when you do tshuva from love, God considers it like a mitzvah, and that was demonstrated by King David. He showed that he, he could admit to the truth. Now, what are these two explanations of that root of lahodot? What do they have in common to admit and to be grateful? The idea of being grateful is to admit there's somebody else besides you. We live in a world today, everything's about entitlement, everything. You're entitled to change your gender, God forbid. You're entitled to do whatever the heck you want. And you don't have to follow any rules because it's all about your rights. But a Jew looks at life as what do I have to do next? Not what am I um, entitled to, but what do, what's my responsibility here? And so it really admitting the truth is admitting that you're not everything. 
and it's not all coming to you, that the world isn't coming to us. Who says we have to be here in the first place? Hashem and his kindness put us in this world in order to get the world to come, which is perfection. And he wanted us to feel that we won't be people taking it and feeling like, um, feeling like it's undeserved. So he puts us through the, hoop, the hoops. He makes us jump hurdles because he wants us eventually to get to the point where we're going to get a tremendous reward and we'll feel kind of like we deserve it, even if we don't. So Leah was a person that always realized that she, had a, she owed something. But it's interesting what she did. She, she decided that this time I'm going to thank Hashem, even if it's for more than what I deserve, even if it's, it's, it's less than I deserve because it's, it's perfect anyways, even, even if just because the king is giving me attention. It says the end of the verse, Al Kain Kara Eshmo Yehuda. Therefore, she called his name Yehuda. Why did she do that? I heard a beautiful interpretation of Yaakov Yosef Herman, the famous All for the Boss. If you ever read that book, if you hadn't, you have to read it. It's a must read. Yaakov Yosef Herman, Sechron Levracha, tells us that the reason she called his name Yehuda is because she knew the only way to remember to be grateful is to constantly talk about it. In other words, anytime little Yehuda would come by, she's saying, Yehuda, she's saying, I, I owe, I admit, I'm grateful, just by calling his name. She's using those terms. You know, there's an expression in Tehillim, Hemanti Kiadaber. If you want to have a Muna, you have to talk about it. If you want to be grateful, we have to voice it. We have to act it out. And eventually, we, we feel it. Now, it's very common to take things for granted. Uh, it's, it's human nature. And I'll explain that in a minute. There was once somebody, I happened to just, I usually don't read the Hamodia. I just don't know. It's just not my weekly newspaper. But one, at one point, I, I, I had a Hamodia one week. And I, I was so happy I got it because it had a fantastic column by Rav Avram Tversky, Zichron of Racha. And um, in it, somebody asked him an interesting question. There, was two guys, there were two friends that, um, you know, friends from youth, and they, they spent a lot of times together. And one of them uh, went to medical school. In the middle of medical school, his friend helped him out financially. Unbelievable. Really went all of his way out with them. And as soon as he became a doctor, he forgot his friend. He never corresponded with him. He, maybe they'd send Rosh Hashanah cards or something. That was it. They never, they, they, they lost touch with each other. And this one friend was writing in to, to Rabbi Dr. Tversky, and they asked him, Rabbi, I don't know what to do. I supported him through medical school. I barely hear a word from him. So Rabbi Tversky answered him, you know, this is the human condition. He doesn't want to remember those days where he was beholden to you. He doesn't want to remember those days where you were his friend. Now he's an MD. He doesn't need, you know, he's in a different league. He barely remembers you. You know, like he doesn't want to remember those days where he was beholden. So therefore, people don't like to be grateful because if you're too grateful, that means that you were a nothing and you were just a taker at one point in your life. And nobody wants to be a taker. So Rabbi Tversky answered him, you know, um, he said that the, that, that the, what was it? The, um, what was his name? Chasim Sofer said, he said, the Chasim Sofer once said, if somebody insults you, this is very good for all you Shadchanim out there, and Lori included. If somebody ever insults you, you should know you must have done them a big favor. And that's very interesting. It's because, again, that push, person wanting to push away their feelings of being beholden. They don't want to feel beholden, you know? So they, so they, they, they don't, to the point where if they insult you, it's a problem. I had a personal experience. I used to have people over my house. We used to have like, uh, at one point, we had a lot of people coming in and out of our doors. And we had different people we kind of adopted. We had auntie this and auntie that, this lady who was all alone in the world and that lady who was, you know, had nobody else. And they became adopted family. They felt like family members. We sent them all the pictures of the new babies and, and everything. They were really a part of the family. But sometimes I found some of these people would insult me terribly. They'd have, they'd have meltdown in the middle of my living room. I didn't know what to do with myself. So every year after Pesach, Rav Scheinberg, Sechron Levracha, would always come to Toronto. So when he came to Toronto, I decided to pose him that question. I said, Rav Scheinberg, I have friends that have connections with these ladies too. They don't insult them. 
they go to their house and, and they come once in six weeks and they, they, they love them. They love their food. They love their everything and everything's fine. For me, they're always like insulting me. I'm getting insults right, left and center. And with converts, I've had that too. Not, not often, but I've had a lot of converts that don't have anything to do with me anymore. Like, they, I, you know, they don't want to remember those days. So I asked for Scheinberg, like, am I doing something wrong? So I remember him telling me, keep going. <laughs> he told me, keep doing it. He said, if they insult you, that means they, you must be making a special mark in their life. He says, if they feel they can already insult you, then they feel a closeness to you. They feel that you care about them. And it's a, you know, that's sometimes, you know, we do chesed. We don't want to do it so much because sometimes it's not hard. Now, I'm not saying you should run to, do, to be insulted, but I don't think that's what he meant to me. But he's trying to tell me that if someone does insult you, chesed isn't always like a free ride. You don't always get your payback in this world. And that's one of the ways that usually people don't respect somebody that's gone all the way out for them. And then we do it more for the right reasons. But the idea of, of taking things for granted is so common that we don't, we don't wanna, we wanna feel we're doing such, so well that we don't need others. But gratitude is something of seeing the other person, thinking about the other person. And we should speak about it. We should speak about our gratitude and, and every day to so many people we should be grateful to and, and Hashem orchestrated, they should come and help us out and all the things we take for granted. I had a hip surgery about two months ago and for like three weeks, I wasn't allowed to take a shower. I could only sponge bathe. And I, the first time I took a shower, I'm telling you, it took me two hours to get over the feeling. It was like, I, I can't tell you the hot water. It was, it was like unbelievable pleasure that we take for granted. And um, this is something that, you know, we can, we can definitely, there's so many little things in our life. This is a Rabbi Victor Miller type of talk. He said it took him 10 years to properly appreciate the soles of his shoes. You know, we can look at the beauty of an apple, the symmetry of a flower. And there's so many things we can take, take time. It makes our lives happier. And it's also being grateful and recognizing what's, recognizing what's been given to us instead of always feel the entitlement, well, I don't have this. Let's look at what we do have, not to take things for granted. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to hit the Nile River. And it's interesting. And here was commanded by Hashem. I don't know about you, but if Hashem would have told me to hit the Nile, I would do it. Moshe Rabbeinu passed the staff, so to speak, literally over to his brother Aaron and Aaron hit the Nile for the plagues. Why? For the plagues that involved the water because the water saved his life. He couldn't bring himself to, to not give respect to even an inanimate object that had benefited him. And that's supposed to be our attitude to, to the world, even to inanimate objects. We're supposed to appreciate everything that we have. And you know, Rav, Rav Dessler, the Colonel of Racha tells us that faith, if we want to have amuna, amuna comes from being a giver. Being a giver doesn't only necessarily mean to do chesed. It means to see the other. Because that's true chesed, is to see the other person, not just to see yourself. To, to, to appreciate, what, when you appreciate, it's a form of giving. You're saying, you know, look at what she brought me. Isn't that a nice gift? I remember there was a Rebetzin in Toronto. She rest in peace. Rebetzin Friedler, she rest in peace. She, there was once a Friday uh, that was Purim and Shabbos was coming and they got over a hundred Mishloach Manot, more probably, probably closer to 200. And they're all over the table. And I, I don't remember how I heard this story. I think her daughter told this to me. And um, her daughter was anxious to clean up already. It was getting close to Shabbos and she wanted to clean up, you know, put everything away because, you know, there's a lot to do, you know, when you have like all this, these packages strewn all over your dining room. And her mother said, no. And she said, why not? And she says, I wanna go and see what each person gave us. And she would make phone calls. You gave me something very unusual. Thank you for that. Like who would look at that to see what each person brought to her? But she did that because she was trying to appreciate. If we were, say, we cultivate that, that mida, that trait of appreciating what people do for us and appreciating uh, what Hashem does for us because people are just emissaries it will really make our lives, as we said, happier. And we're really doing what we're supposed to be doing in this world because it's really the truth. It's really admitting to the truth. And it's being a giver to see what others need or what we can do for others or what others have given us versus to focus on ourselves so much. 
Hakarasatov, gratitude in Hebrew is recognizing good, to notice, to notice the details, to notice what people, you know, do, do for ourselves. I don't know how many more minutes I have. I have, I can go on for like six, seven more minutes. Are we still, am I still okay? Go for it. It's so good. Okay. 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 Anyways, another, this is a story that really, there's a few stories that really blow my mind. Here's some of my favorite stories. I'm about to tell you three of them. Barry Levin, Zatzal, the Tzadik of Yerushalayim. He was like um, a kind of a principal in the Eitz Chaim um, Cheder in Yerushalayim. So he, he was a mashkiach. He was the person that had to notice what every student needed. So what he did was he, he, he would go look through classroom windows and see how everything's going. One time he was doing his daily activity of you know, going to each classroom and he had, a, had a, a family member, I believe, accompanying him that time. And he asked his family member, what do you see when you look in the window? And he said, oh, that boy in the front row, he looks bored. And this boy, he looks a little bit... Uh, he looks a little bit, uh, you know, like he has an attitude. And this boy looks clever. And this boy looks at, and Avari Levin looks at him. He says, you know what? I don't notice that. He says, what do you, what do you notice? And Avari Levin says, I notice this one. His shoes look, they're broken. He looks like he needs a new pair of shoes. And I notice this person, he looks like very lonely. I notice what they need. The other boy thought he, he, did, he accomplished so much. He knew who they were. He says, he notices what they need. And that's what we're supposed to notice in others. Tehillim helps us with that because it gets us outside of ourselves. And if you notice David Amelech in so many chapters of Tehillim, he's in the middle of saying how some terrible things are happening to him. It starts out like that. And then by the end, he's praising Hashem. It's an amazing thing, you know, but that's what he, he, he you know. Now there's another, I have two other stories about this. Another one, Rav, uh, seeing the other, Rav Schneer Cutler, Zechran Lebracha, who was the Second in command in Lakewood Yeshiva started by Rabbi Aaron Cutler. But when Rav Schneer, his son, uh, led the Yeshiva, that's when it really grew. By Rabbi Aaron's days, it was maybe in the hundreds. By Rav Schneer, it went into the thousands of students. Unbelievable story. The story always like, it really, really hits me hard. Um, there, was, there was once a Malava Malka in the Catskills. It was Shabbat Nachamu. And you know, they were having some kind of you know, band and music and speakers and this kind of thing. And he was invited. I think he was gonna be the speaker. There were 450 people assembled and he walks in the room, they start playing music you know, in his honor. And when he walks in, everyone comes up to him, offers a hand. <laughs> it wasn't COVID days. And um, he, what's it called? He notices one man, a former student, Rav Eliyahu Roman, Zechronel of Rechel, who I believe lived in Los Angeles. I can maybe at the end tell me if you knew him personally. Um, so Elio Roman, he noticed. And he said, Elio, what's wrong? And he said, uh, Rebbe, the truth is my daughter has an inexplicable rash and we've gone, we don't know what to do. So Rav, Rav Schneer always kept in his pocket a pencil or a pen and a, a pad of paper. He wrote down a certain uh, pediatrician's number to call. He said, he's an expert, call him. After the home of Malka was over, Rabbi Roman decided to approach Rav Schneer and ask him, Rabbi, I have a question to ask you. There were 400 people here tonight, 450. How did you notice me? And he said, I saw it in your eyes. Because the eyes see and they can be seen. In someone's eyes, you can see if they're sad, you can see if they're lonely, you can see if they're, if they're feeling, you know, anyway, nervous, excited, angry, whatever. You see it in their eyes. Said, Rav Schneer looked in everybody's eyes and he noticed one man was missing something. That's the great person. That's a great person. And that's what we're trying to, gratitude is an idea of get outside of ourselves. Thank everybody around us. We tend to be very, um, we lack appreciation. We take for granted people in our own inner circle, our own family. <laughs> that's what we take the most for granted. And that's what we have to be more careful. How many times do we say a negative thing how many times do we remember to praise and be grateful for this person's presence in our life? The, um, and one other story I wanted to share, I, I could go on and on. I just hope I don't go on too long. Okay, two more stories I have and that's it. Um, so the, uh, another, another story that I think is amazing about appreciating something. There was a rabbi that used to live in Toronto. His name was Rabbi Rivlin. He should rest in peace. He was a very great person and he was, he used to walk around with, he used to formerly, before Toronto, he um, 
used to live in the New York area, and he was the sidekick, so to speak, of Ramosha Feinstein, always going with him, collecting funds and doing all kinds of things with him. Anyways, he accompanied Ramosha to all these buildings where they went up and knocked on doors and collected money for the yeshiva, MTJ, on the Lower East Side. Anyways, so when Ramosha was 75 years old, they once had to walk up three floors to a walk-up apartment. They didn't have an elevator. And they, you know, asked for a donation from this family. The wife gave them some tea and they, you know, thanked her for the donation. They left the place. They were outside. And guess what happened? Ramesha tells Rabbi Rivlin, we never thanked her for the tea. Rabbi Rivlin says, he's so, he said, Ramesha says, I'm, I want to go back upstairs now and thank her for the tea. And Rabbi Rivlin, who knew Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was a man that never wasted a second always thinking about the Jewish people, always thinking about the Torah. He didn't have time for every little, you know, that's a big, a big effort for a 75 year old. He said to him, Rebbe, you can't call her on the phone to thank her. No, he said, no, I have to go upstairs. And he went upstairs, he thanked her for the tea and then he went down three flights of stairs to leave. Now, what could be his reasoning for this? And I think the answer is, there's a Gemara that says, I don't remember where this Gemara is, but I heard it years ago, that if somebody gives you beans, you owe them meat. Now, how can that be? Why should your appreciation be that when somebody gives you something, you give them more? Because really, when anybody gives you something, they gave you more than you know about. You don't know their feelings the moment you came in. Maybe it was a hard day for them. Maybe they, they were thinking about to make you happy. That's beside the tea. They had that feeling of love and comfort and respect. Perhaps, you know, th there could be a lot of side things, secret things that we don't even realize when we're being served a cup of tea. So the, um, the idea was that Ramosha Feinstein felt, I have, I don't know, I'm, I'm indebted to her. I gave, she, I don't know what she gave me. She didn't just give me tea, she gave me more. And I don't even know how much she owes. I owe her a personal thank you. He felt it was worthwhile for him to go up three flights of stairs to give her that thank you. That's how far appreciation should be. We, we so much take for granted so many gifts we have until God forbid we lose them. Then we all of a sudden appreciate them. But we're supposed to, we're supposed to think, of, we're supposed to think of, of the other person and how, how much they extend themselves for us. We have to be grateful for how much we get from Hashem that we don't deserve. We find all our prayers in the sitter are usually in, in um, plural because we're always supposed to be praying for other people. We're supposed to be thinking of others. That's supposed to be our, our more of our outlook, the more we're outside of ourselves, the happier people we're going to be. And, and that's how we really get to more amuna. Deepening amuna is not just looking at a sitter and davening, it's seeing to whom we're talking. If we can, if we, then we're having faith. Faith means seeing outside of yourself, seeing that there's a creator. And the way to do that is by deepening our acts of giving, our acts of thinking of the others, our acts of appreciation. I'll just end off with this last story. There's a story from this Rav Yitzhak Zelig Sokolov, who was called the Sokolor, the Sokolor Rebbe, I hope pronouncing it properly. And there was a famous, in his day in Europe, there was a famous uh, lumber merchant by the name of Rabbi Kalman. Rabbi Kalman was a very generous man and a very, very wealthy individual. And one time a fire broke out and he lost everything, lost everything. And he was so broken, he went to his Rebbe, the Sokolor Rebbe, and he told him, Rebbe, I don't know what to do. Is God angry with me? Like, why is God punishing me like this? I had it so good. I, I, I thought I was using my funds to help others. I was trying to think of others. I was always helping the community. And now everything was taken away from me. How am I supposed to look at this? So the Rebbe answered him. He says, it says in Gemara Sanhedrin 92b, that um, Nebuchadnezzar, who was you know, the one that destroyed our first temple, he wanted to praise God when he destroyed our temple, he wanted to sing Shira. He wanted to thank God through song. And he said, you know, my song, I'm going to be so grateful that I destroyed that temple. My song is going to be the, better than the, the Tehillim of King David. That was his hopes. What does it say in the Gemara? Strange thing. And we're not supposed to take this actually. We're supposed to understand there's a deeper meaning. What happened? It says an angel came and slapped him on the mouth and he wasn't able to say Shira. So what does that mean, that Gemara? So the Kutzka Rebbe explains that um, if his song would have been more beautiful than David, why would God stop him? It's not, that he wasn't stopping him. He was telling him, I want to test you. If you want to sing to me, Shira, see if your life is hard 
and then see if you still sing Shira. And that's what David did do. No matter what his situation was, he always found a, spy, a space to be grateful. And that's what the Sakala Rebbe comforted him. He says, Rav Kalman, you did so much. Hashem loved your Shira. But now he wants you to sing Shira when things are harder. He wants to be grateful when things are harder. And a lot of people were tested sometimes. We have times in our life where, where we're tested with hardship because we're supposed to find the gratitude even in those hard times. And that's what David and Melch did. He always saw the good. He always turned it into the good. And that's really what we're supposed to do in our lives. I thank you for listening and hope you continue your beautiful work with your Tehillim. Anything doing on a ritual schedule is wonderful. That means you have a, you know, you're doing it on a daily basis, a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful thing. And I hope you really continue these, this wonderful uh, internet thing that you've got going here. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. That was really beautiful, really beautiful. Um, I was very inspired, loved your stories, loved your, your Torah knowledge, and I love that you give your share with a smile. That is so special, Dora Hana. It, it really brings all your words to life to have it delivered with your smile. Well, I have to say my, my mother always smiled and my grandmother always smiled. So it's, it's inherited. It wasn't me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to comment that um, Sippy Twisky, who's here with us today, her husband, I once um, pestered him to give a talk to if a man's role in this world is to learn Torah, what is a woman's? It doesn't really say anywhere what a woman's role is. And he did all the research and he came up with a beautiful talk and he ended up with proofs that a woman's role in this world is to do chesed. So what you brought out about chesed today really spoke to me that, in fact, I just said this to somebody the other day, no good deed goes unpunished, that, you know, you can really stretch yourself and do things for people. And it comes back, unfortunately, to bite you. Um, but knowing that that's our purpose in the world is to do chesed. I mean, it, it just can inspire everybody when you get out of bed in the morning, you say your Tehillim, whether it's a sad Tehillim, a positive Tehillim, but the Tehillim that you mentioned, it's so often King David starts out with, oh, woe is me, look what's happening to me, but I'm still going to praise you, Hashem, you know, like it's always, it's always inspiring. Um, if you look carefully, it's, it, it is true. There is no Tehillim where he just totally ends off with woe is me. Never. There's no sad Tehillim. He turns it, 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 in fact, if you analyze every Tehillim, he gives you the Torah way of looking at it, mm -hmm. how you're supposed to look at this particular suffering. Beautiful. If uh, anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. What, does, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything that they want to say? Thank God I can't get tomatoes thrown at me. That's uh, anything but. <laughs> I'm safe. Anybody? Uh, yeah, I'm. Um, I, 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 I so appreciate it because um, I, I've had a very difficult year medically and Tehillim has really been my um, go-to. So I expanded even on our daily Tehillim, but that, because that was our daily gratitude to Tehillim, um, you know, that was always a point of making sure. But I, I, I knew that, that David Amelech often starts out with like, woe is me. And a lot of times I question, like, it almost sounds like his amuna was lacking at times. But your explanation that every parak basically finishes off with either his gratitude to Hashem or his praising of Hashem makes, it, makes me understand it better. Because I don't know that I always focused on that. Of, you said you know, a very good point. You mentioned a very good point just now. That yeah. why, if you're asking a question or like, it sounds like as a hidden question, why did he fetch to begin with? Yeah, yeah. Well, the answer is that God doesn't expect us to be a piece of wood. That's nice. Yeah, that's good. He doesn't that's want good. us to be a piece of wood. He Sometimes we're supposed to cry. And, you know, right. that in the Vardic, there's this whole, if you ever know about the Bitachan hotline in Lakewood, I'm a very big fan of it. If anybody knows no. about it, I, I don't have the number on me right now, but it's a daily thing in Bitachan. It's unbelievable. But in the Vardic or in many other circles, you're supposed, they said you should divide your day in half, half a day praising God and half a day requesting. Like when mm -hmm. you pray, pour out your heart. You're not supposed to, it doesn't mean, in fact, God gives us a problem 
God gives us a problem for us to pray. The whole reason right. why we're given problems, he's squeezing out of us prayer. Right. And it's not always, but the interesting thing, which I didn't mention because I can't go on forever, is that, um, that it, it says there's a lot of angels running around in heaven bringing our prayers of uh, request to Hashem. And there's very few angels that are giving thanks to Hashem. Like, you know, we, we spend most, we, the prayer is both parts. It's, it's asking for things. God wants us to ask. And he mm -hmm. also wants us to pray. So that's supposed to be what it's like. Right. Th this I heard, I don't know if anybody's ever heard Rabbanit Kineret Sarah Kohn, but in one of her shiurim, she said, Hashem wouldn't put pain in you unless he wants you to do something. And he sends us these painful messages for our own good so that we can grow. And, and I have to say, it's been an incredible year of growth, despite all the other things that went on. But really? And especially uh, our generation, we're not meant yeah. to not like people like the Avra, Mitzvah, and Yaakov, they, their immediate response was judged. We are not judged. I heard this from a Kalman mm -hmm. Crohn's itself. We're not mm -hmm. judged on our immediate response. Immediate mm. response, you can kick and scream and you didn't like what happened today and it was horrible. And, you know, it's, the main thing is you get out of it and you elevate yourself. But to feel the mm -hmm. initial feelings of grief, of mourning, of whatever it is, that's human. And, you, you know, mm -hmm. You know, people, different people feel differently and we can't judge anyone or ourselves for that. Nice. Very nice. That's, that's a good you point. You should feel good. Thank you. Baruch Hashem, I do. I, yeah. Baruch Hashem. Will you tell everybody about your Torah takeaway, Torah with the takeaway? Okay. My Torah with takeaway is Tuesday mornings, 10 a.m. on Zoom. And that Deb Menzel thing that you announced, it's in your um, promotion. She, uh, she's taking, she does all, she'll get you on the email list. And if you want to have a reminder about it weekly, we do the Parsha, but we have a life-changing lesson in every class guaranteed or your money back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say, but you know, it's, um, we have some lovely women in the group and um, Ellie Sheva Shields is what, who got me here. And she's in our group. She's moderating it now. That was really something of her. The first, she just immediately jumped in and became a moderator. And um, we have some people from Israel in there and we have Torontonians and some other people from other in New Yorkers. Um, so we're not probably as big as this group is, but we've been doing it. Um, and, nice. um, and it's also up, up on somebody uh, um, uh, records it and it's up on YouTube. If oh, you just look nice. DC Weisswasser Torah with a takeaway, we have all our shiurim from the last year up there. Yes, I was able to Google it Torah with a takeaway and find you. Uh, with yeah so this all happened through COVID we I was originally just speaking locally and then all you know we got to spread our wings this way that's right so let's that's just right. hope all of us are realizing that that you know okay we have well, to I'm learn gonna, our lessons I'm going to end with thanking our speaker thanking Ellie Sheva Shields for finding you and and connecting you to us and enjoy invite everybody to join us with our 26th round of daily gratitude to him where we say just one chapter a day in thanks to Hashem for all the blessings he gives us because we want to be proactive and say Hashem you don't have to give us pain you don't have to give us some sorrows for us to come close to you we realize that a hot shower and being able to walk to uh, pick up our laundry or our kids is all a blessing. It's all a blessing. So thank you. And you are a blessing, Dvorakana. Keep spreading your light to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.